Coming up on Tech News today, we take OS X Mountain Lion for a spin and explain why Nintendo's revenue loss is good news, but Apple's revenue gain is bad news. It's a topsy-turvy earnings world. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, July 25th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones from your home or office. Find out what your gadget is worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the world of technology, starting by giving you the top 10 stories of the day in the news fuse. Apple stock has taken a bit of a beating after announcing a 23% rise in revenue from last year to $8.8 billion. Bad news uh, Wall Street analysts wanted $10.37 per share of earnings, but they only got $9.32 per share. As good as the numbers might sound at first glance, it is much slower growth than Apple usually shows. Sales of all major product lines rose except for the iPod, which is expected. Apple also announced in their earnings call that OS X Mountain Lion would come out this morning, and it did. You can get it in the Mac App Store for $19 dollars and 99 cents because of a teeny little patent dispute with apple samsung has disabled an advanced search function in an update to the international version of its galaxy s3 phone like the u.s version once the software is installed the phones no longer search contacts apps or other on-device material using google software because apple says it infringes apple's patent to a single search interface which it uses in its siri app to collate results from a bunch of sources. The best part is, is users weren't told about the update beforehand. Users love that. It's Just a, do a search. It's a feature. Things are removed when you're not paying attention. <laughs> Twitter CEO Dick Costolo told the New York Times that the company is building tools to let Twitter users export their tweets to a downloadable file. The export will be limited to your own content, so you won't be able to download other people's old tweets. So when will you be able to read what you were writing back in the day? Uh, no time frame was given. The gathering of athletes in the major southern city of Great Britain this year has lots of restrictions on what you can say about it and what you can carry with you if you attend one of its events. Am I allowed to say event? Is no. that one of the no? okay. Olympics? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, ah. there's now an extra restriction. You will not be allowed to take a Wi Fi hotspot with you into any of the events. Now, we could be charitable and say they may want to cut down on interference, but chances are they're just being dicks. That's all it's. <laughs> Got $1,300 to burn in this economy? Who doesn't? If so, you can get a tablet complete with Qualcomm's first quad-core APQ8064 Snapdragon chip. Qualcomm dual-core S4 silicon can already be found in mobile devices like the Galaxy S3 and the HTC One S. The S4 will appear in the 4G version of the Asus Transformer Pad Infinity tablet, so one might expect the quad-core Qualcomm chip in phones too, eventually. Foursquare announced that it's testing promoted updates starting today. That means ads. Uh, when you visit the Explore section of Foursquare, you'll see ads from companies that Foursquare promises are relevant. The company has 20 advertisers on board with the pilot program, including The Gap and Best Buy. Apple's profits were disappointing, sure, but Nintendo's losses were good news? Yeah. How's that work? Nintendo lost 10.3 billion yen in its first fiscal quarter, but that was about half of the 20.6 billion yen analysts had expected. It was also less than the 37.7 billion yen it lost a year ago. Uh, some clever cost cutting, good sales of new software titles reduced the losses, and Nintendo is still expecting a profit of 35 billion yen for its fiscal year based on sales of the Nintendo 3DS, which is finally profitable, and the forthcoming Wii U. I imagine high fives like, could have been worse. Yay! Yay! <laughs> We're not 
not so bad. Uh, not good news coming bad. from Arm. Arm reported higher than expected quarter two profits thanks to high demand for Arm-powered smartphones and tablets. Arm said it generated $103 million in profit on revenue of $213 million, or 2.3 cents per share, which beat all analyst predictions, many of whom expected lower growth due to tough economic conditions. Arm's net profit rose by 48% to $61 million for the quarter ending June 30th from $17.5 million a year earlier. And finishing up in earnings land, Netflix's Q2 earnings were good. Return to profitability of $6 million, gain of 530,000 subscribers in the United States. The company also teased the launch of Netflix in a, quote, additional attractive European market. Where all the pretty people are. Must be Italians. Awesome. Maybe Spain. Mm. I don't know. Uh, it could be a lot. They're lookers. In a, ladder, in, a ladder, in a letter to shareholders, CEO Reed Hastings and CFO David Wells wrote about, quote, opportunities to work together referring to HBO, which got a lot of folks excited. Uh, but then Reuters went and poured cold water over it. HBO spokesman Jeff Cusson told Reuters, we are not in discussions and have no plans to work with Netflix. Well, that was depressing. Ooh. The dream, EU, dream crashers. Yeah, just, Sorry. Just killing our dreams. The EU is looking for Google to change up how it practices business, not just in Europe, but worldwide. The EU Competition Commission has said it's been concerned about Google's potentially anti-competitive behavior. Oh, yeah, and Google's facing a fine of up to $4 billion. Well, they probably should go and sell some gadgets on our sponsor <laughs> to make up for that loss. Uh, this episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle. Uh, if you want the latest iPhone, the iPad, the MacBook, the Android Spork phone, you just need 20 bucks to upgrade to Mountain Lion. Uh, it's a simple way to get money and get it quick. Here, how, here's how you do it. You go to Gazelle. It's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot -L -L -E com. And do it right away to lock in a risk-free quote. It doesn't doesn't obligate you to anything. You just go and say, hey, I, I've got this tablet. Uh, it's in good condition. Uh, maybe it's in flawless condition. I've got these, these, these uh, wires for it. And they say, okay, we're going to give you this amount of money. And that quote that they give you right then is good for 30 days. You've got 30 days to get them the product. Uh, and the thing is, those prices don't go up over time. Gadgets don't get more valuable over time. So you want to do it right away. Lock in that number. And then... When you decide, okay, I want the money, all you do is print out the shipping label and send the gadget off to them. Sometimes they'll even send you a box if you don't have a box to put it in. Uh, real quickly, as soon as they get it, they'll verify the condition. They'll even upgrade it if they're like, no, this is in better condition than you said. And then they'll send you your money. You'll get, uh, you can get it by check. You can get it by PayPal. Uh, you get 5% bonus if you choose an Amazon gift card. If you're going to buy your gadget from Amazon anyway, uh, you might as well do that. Uh, and it's risk-free. So go do it right now. G A Z E L L E dot com. I've tr I've tried it uh, plenty of times. I've sold lots of gadgets this week just because it's simple. It doesn't take a lot of time. You get that shipping label. You drop it off at the place, and you get your money soon. So check check it out. Gazelle dot com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Okay, so Mountain Lion came out this morning, uh, waking everyone up on the the West Coast because <laughs> everybody <laughs> I was like, oh my god, everybody thought they were about to die. <laughs> but oh, thankfully, it was just Apple. System. Uh, I I dragged myself out of bed, downloaded it, uh, installed it. Took me about an hour total, from like I'd say less than twenty minutes of download time, uh, and then just it, it took a long install, but not the worst, longest install. Yeah, I've I ever actually had. thought that I could make it happen before I left the house and. The download itself took the half hour I thought the whole thing would be. I was actually really trying to make sure I got it installed in time to get on the morning stream with Scott Johnson. Uh -huh. uh, I had my Skype ready on my phone just in case, and it finished the install, and I was able to log in and boot Skype uh, right in time to do the call. The thing is, that, that first boot up is scary. You get a lot of beach balls. You get a mm -hmm. lot of waiting. I tried launching Skype once, and it failed. I had to force quit it. Uh, so be patient if you do decide to install this. It, that first boot up, like any operating system install, takes a long time. But so far, so good. Everything I've tried has worked. Usually when, when, when OS X or any operating system is updated, the 10.8.0, the whatever the point zero one is, I avoid like the plague. Because mm -hmm. usually, at least for Apple, at least I've noticed this, until it's X point, point, like point 0.5 at the end there, it's not stable. Yeah, I've I've had so many problems with applications breaking, and for all the developers to catch up because Apple changed something. Uh, I'm usually running like mission critical stuff on certain hardware, so I think I'm running like Leopard on one of my old machines because I know if I install some of this new stuff, it's gonna break every little hacked thing I put together. Which is really what the Gold Master is supposed to be for. It's like here's the here here's our chance for just 
anything, just last tiny little fixes because this thing is really stable. But I, as like you say, it doesn't I'm always just work terrified that way. So one. If you're, if you're, if you have no other reason to wait, uh, wait. That, that's 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 our advice. The, usually, that first new patch is probably the safest time to get in there. Ars Technica actually graphed out how long it's generally taken for the first patch to come in OS 10, and it hovers around 20 days. So if you can wait 20 days, then you'll get you'll get a more stable release. It actually did a software update immediately after I installed it, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting because it's coming through the App Store anyway. You think they could roll that stuff in there? But uh, that's one of the reasons it took a while for me to a be able to launch programs like Skype because it was doing that software update. Once it was done with that software update, everything worked fine. Uh, if you're wondering, like, wait a minute, I don't remember, what am I getting in Mountain Lion? You're getting integration with iOS stuff. Uh, notes, reminders, Game Center, uh, notification, no center. notification Center, Share Sheets, and Twitter integration. Uh, I went into Safari, logged into Twitter, it immediately popped up and said, hey, we see you're logging into Twitter, would you like to integrate that into OS X? I mm -hmm. didn't have to do it, but it gave me the option to do it right there. I didn't even have to go into settings. Uh, also, AirPlay mirroring. So you can send your te your uh, video from your laptop to your Apple TV. Really comes in handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know you've already used it on the, the developer preview. In, yeah, in the, in, the, in the beta version. Single sign in for contacts, mail, calendar, messages, FaceTime, and find my Mac. Uh, so you don't have to sign into each one every time. Once you've signed in, you've signed in for all of them. That's nice. And Where did I leave my Mac? <laughs> 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 Better load up find my Mac. Yeah, you guess if, you know, if you're Andy and Notco and you got a handful of them, sure. uh, you might come in happy. Uh, and Power Nap. Which is when it's asleep, it can still do software updates, uh, and do backups to Time Machine, and uh, sync with iCloud. I'm also looking forward to uh, file management being a little bit different, acting more like an app. For example, Pages on the Mac, the documents living within Pages and then just being updated in iCloud so that I can download them or access them rather on an iPad later on, which sounds great, but it does force me to think about file management a little bit differently. I don't go to Finder and look for it somewhere. It's just in the app itself. That's where the documents live. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I'll see if I break that habit. Uh, when I installed it, by the way, only three applications were listed as incompatible. Two of them are applications, frankly, I forgot were on my hard drives. <laughs> they haven't been updated in quite a long time. I'm not going to name them because they're probably working fine with Mountain Lion. I just hadn't upgraded them. And the other one uh, was Air Display, which I hadn't upgraded recently. And what's what's cool about that is immediately Air Display sent me a note, said, hey, we see you, you have an updated Air Display. You want to update it? Uh, it'll it'll work. Just just do the update right now. So I, I think my favorite thing that's different so far is the notifications center, which is very elegantly on the right side of your screen. And there's a you'll see a little menu item up there in the upper right hand corner now that you can just click on and it slides over to the right. Uh, you can tweet right from there if you want to post to Twitter. Uh, it'll show you your recent mentions uh, from Twitter down there, your calendar items, uh, all that stuff. It's it's a it's a pretty nice and elegant sort of aspect to it. Thing is that's not the thing that the reason you should get Mountain Lion. There's a lot of of stability and background uh, uh, operations revamping that they did. This is not a minor upgrade. The way Snow Leopard was from Leopard, a lot of people said. Uh, there's a lot more going on under the hood here. Is Gatekeeper turned on by default? Gatekeeper is that uh, that security setting where only Mac App Store uh, apps are installable unless you turn it off. Right. Uh, the Gatekeeper default is App Store and signed apps okay. uh, are allowed to be installed. It won't install anything else unless you go into settings and say allow anything to install. That's, that's interesting, actually, because there's a uh, piece of malware out there called Crisis or More Cut that's been coming as a Java archive file pretending to be Adobe Flash. It drops multiple components, reconfigures system settings, installs a backdoor. It even is cross-platform. It detects whether you're running Mac or Windows and installs the appropriate bits uh, based on what it sees. Now, the one thing it does do, it, it's pretty nasty because it doesn't ask for your permission or your or a password to install, which is, a, which is a workaround to OS X security. But it does give you a signature alert saying, hey, this, this piece of software is not signed do you want to install it? In Mountain Lion, if you're running Gatekeeper and saying don't allow any uh, unsigned installations, theoretically, now I haven't tested this or confirmed it, but theoretically it shouldn't install. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be Gatekeeper doing its job. So anyway, that's uh, that's my look at OS X Mountain Lion. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about where we heard about Mountain Lion first. The Apple earnings call yesterday evening. Uh, Tim Cook kind of threw it in there like, oh, we're going to be, yeah, we're launching Mountain Lion tomorrow. And everybody's like, really? 
okay, and it and it happened. Uh, as we mentioned in the news views, net income of eight point eight billion dollars, earnings per share nine dollars and thirty two cents, missing analyst expectation. Uh, so people are are worried. Uh, iPhone sales were up twenty eight percent. iPads up eighty four percent. Uh, Mac sales up 2%, iPods down 10%. That's pretty typical. Apple TV actually up 170%, only 1.3 million Apple TVs, but still a lot. So the key question is why? Why is Apple showing slower growth this quarter? Well, I think a big part of it, and this is especially important because so much of Apple revenues come from iPhone sales, is that people expect a new iPhone in the fall. And so people are buying a new iPhone. Yeah, you know, I'd, I know we're in the next quarter at this point. We're in, we're in Q4, really, for Apple. But even in Q3, I wouldn't have bought a 4S because I wouldn't have felt like I was getting my money's worth because I would just want the new device when it came out. Apple even, uh, on the earnings call, um, uh, Tim Cook said as much. Listen, there's expectations from people. There are a lot of rumors and speculation, and that just all factors into people's buying habits. What do you say? Rumors are a great thing about this country. Something like that. <laughs> I'm super excited. About I love them. the rumors, yeah. even when they're Pretty wrong. Good. I love the rumors. You know, to get, the, to get these four S's out. I mean, that would explain why Apple did all those deal with those uh, those prepaid carriers to get more sales of those devices out there. Because, okay, they're major carriers are selling as many as they possibly can. What markets aren't they saturating? And it's the prepaid market, and then they're on Virgin now. They're on Boost. They're on, I don't know if they're on Boost, actually. Virgin and, and uh, Cricket, a whole bunch of these things at this point. So I'm, I wonder if that's why that, that actually pushed the move towards the prepaid to get the 4S sales further up. So next quarter, you'll be like, oh, wow, we sold a lot more because we're, we're hitting a market that they, that they haven't taken care of before. But they still sold 28% more iPhones than last year, yeah. uh, even mm -hmm. even so. So I, I, they did mention a shift in inventory as one explanation, saying that fewer iPhones were actually sold to distribution channels, more were sold out of retail, and that could affect the accounting because you already have taken the money in a previous quarter for the iPhones that you're selling at retail this quarter. They warned that that could happen to the iPad next quarter because they've shifted distribution uh, to the iPad so that there shouldn't be any iPad shortages. But again, they're taking money for the iPad this quarter sure. that they won't get next quarter. I mean, they sold a lot of iPads. iPads up 84% to 17 Record number million. of iPads, yeah. Record number of iPads. Also, and this is something that happens pretty much every quarter, analysts go way high mm -hmm. based on what Apple actually puts out as their official estimations. Apple always beats their own estimations. Too. Okay. Well, that's fine. And we know that. But then when they beat analyst expectations, which are very high, everyone goes crazy. Wow, Apple's, I mean, you can't stop Apple. It's 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 the most valuable. Uh, but at what point do we have to start getting realistic? I mean, Apple is wanting to beat their own expectations, right? So they're putting it, them at a conservative number, and in theory, it should always be good if they beat those expectations. Well, and the analysts aren't like, I don't know that they're being crazy. They're saying, look, Apple's really, really hot, really good company. This is what they should do given the market conditions. I think they may have underestimated the effect of the economic slowdown mm -hmm. on even Apple. I mean, look look at the fact that they, they sold 2% more Macs this quarter than a year ago. And PC sales were actually down 1% overall in this quarter, in that same quarter. Right. Uh, so they outperformed the market. There's a weak European economy. And if you look at their sales for Europe, they were essentially flat, specifically France, Greece, and Italy uh, were poor. UK sales were up 13%. That was an exception in Europe, but that that's going to slow them down. Mm -hmm. uh, China's going strong 50%. Latin America, they tripled sales. India was flat. And actually Tim Cook indicated they might not emphasize India as much in the near future. But they're doing well in markets that are doing well. And, and they're they're going to be slowed down by the economy the, the way other companies are. I'm sure next quarter they'll be like, oh, we sold everything possible. We're sold out of everything. I mean, we're all expecting a whole bunch of refreshed hardware in October. Uh, there's rumors of what iPod Nano is being redesigned, iPod Touches, iPhone, uh, a 7.85-inch iPad. It's this, this is probably just going to be a minor bump in the road. But, I mean, analysts at some point are just, they kept ratcheting it up because Apple kept beating their expectations. So they're like, well, I guess they're going to do something crazy again. Let's say they're going to sell 8 billion iPads today. It's like, well, no, that didn't happen. I'd be interested to see those Mac numbers next quarter mm -hmm. because we had the Retina MacBook Pro, some refreshed MacBook Airs within the quarter, but 
but, right at the end. But the yeah, the numbers for the whole quarter just doesn't reflect the potential sales. That's all kind of happening right now. So it'll be interesting to see if there's another bump. And they might, uh, if all goes well, maybe a nice 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro. That could be my next. The one purchase. troubling thing I would point out is that Kantar World Panel Comtech, which is a market research firm, uh, put out numbers that they say found Android smartphones collectively outsold the iPhone in every major European market it covered. Mm. Now, that's not every major European market, but it's many of the major European markets. And even if Apple is, is experiencing a slowdown, they're losing out to what are considered to be more affordable, but just as functional smartphone platforms. So they may have to take a different tactic in Europe, at least in the short term. Let's move on to Dick Costello promised to give us our Twitters. Yeah, so uh, as we mentioned in the news views, uh, he told the New York Times CEO D Dick Costolo that Twitter is working on a way to be able to archive your tweets. You know, it's kind of Freedom good for of tweets. yeah, data liberation for all. But there's no time frame, and he says, "Listen, this is extremely difficult to do. It's not like you can just put a few engineers on this and it's going to be easy. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of tweets are sent. Um, I think it's something like 400 million tweets are sent every day. So in order to get all of your tweets that you sent um, in some sort of a file. That's already complicated. But then it kind of brings in the larger, well, when are we actually going to be able to search tweets back more than, let's say, a week? Because that's pretty much all that Twitter allows us to do right now. Um, they are working on that. Obviously, uh, earlier this month, Twitter introduced autocomplete suggestions into search. So whether you're searching for a person or a topic or something relevant, that's easier. But you're still in... Uh, a very recent window. Um, Search Engine Land has a really, really good sort of breakdown of well, what is what is the issue right now? Why why does it why why is it so hard uh, to be able to search back in time on Twitter? Uh, volume aside, um, and notes that obviously back in 2009, both Bing and Google started letting you search for public tweets via the search engines, but as far as right now, even to this day, Bing social search only goes back a week or so, so that's not really all that helpful. Google and Twitter didn't even renew their contract last year, so that's not even doable on Google. Although back in 2009, Google was saying, you can only search back a very short time for now, but we're going to go back a couple of years, back to 2008, once we ramp up. And that's part of the instant search. I mean, they could still index the Twitter pages, yes. theoretically, but that's a much harder thing for the algorithm to do. Exactly. Uh, Russian uh, uh, search site Yandex is also accessing uh, uh, Twitter's firehose, but again, it doesn't really seem to be able to go back any farther than Bing. There are other services that people can use. Topsy uh, is is a is a search engine, really. It's an advanced search engine that will allow you to do things like if I wanted to search for something that I has tweeted and then I wanted that tweet to be within a certain date range, Topsy can go back back to about early 08, but that's not early 06 when Twitter officially did start. Pick up uh, Gina Trapani's company that does think up uh if you want your own tweets that's a great way to get some insight into that right and work on those which is fine but one might say well it would be nice to know what my fifth tweet ever what was sarah was saying about me right <laughs> i don't but, care about my own stuff yeah exactly um and that's why those tools like what was your first tweet those are popular because it's really hard to find that any other way What's also very interesting is the U.S. Library of Congress and their work on archiving tweets. Two years ago, they said, we're going to work with Twitter to make all tweets archivable. All of them, not just yours, not just any of ours. We'd be able to search for anything. Well, two years later, they say, we're getting close. We are. We're still working on this. We're still printing. But they won't be available online. Oh, what? Just, just I was the, joking when I said they're still printing. No, no, you're actually right on track. They're, they're, they're putting them in a database, right? Yes. Yeah. So microfiche, you, probably. you got to go <laughs> to the Library of Congress and look up something. Uh, Old library style. Interesting. Dewey Decimal System. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Facebook has an export. You can get all your data there. So, I mean, maybe it's not just putting a few engineers. You're going to need a whole lot of them to get some ex uh, exporting of this. But, I mean, it's not like Twitter has had a whole lot of, uh, like, hosted content on there. It's just text. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious about why this is taking so long. Not a priority. Just they they and they want to they want to make money off the fire hose. I think that's the other thing. Well, yeah, that and the fire hose for a while, Twitter's it. problem simply was having enough uptime. So I think they were, like you were saying, priority is a definite thing. This is a low priority. To be able to download your own tweets, I guess, I mean, that's useful to see, okay, I want to 
I don't know if you want to export it to some other client. I don't know where you'd go you with it. You could export it into, I guess, a calendar of some kind. Into Google Plus or something. I don't but know. But there are already some third-party services that will do that. Again, they still don't go back all the way. But I find that less interesting. I mean, I guess just for posterity. So if we all download our old tweets and then we all post them up, we can somehow link them together <laughs> with hyperlinks. Five then, years ago today, you were posting this. That that'd be kind of, that could be it. I think Memo Lane does yeah. that. I get emails like, Memo two Lane. years ago, you yeah. did this. And I'm like, oh, wow, I had they, a bad Thursday two years but ago. But they, <laughs> they don't go back to the very beginning because I've actually looked. I'm having a ham sandwich. <laughs> All right, let's move on to, uh, there are lots of earnings calls to talk about. We're only going to talk about a few of them in, in depth. Uh, Nintendo mm -hmm. had a loss, but it was good news. Yes, this is one of the, yeah, you're going to have, you're going to be sad about something, but it'll be good. Okay, so like like you said, the news fuse, Nintendo beat expectations by posting a loss, which is still strange to say. 10.3 billion yen is what was lost in the quarter. Expected to lose 20. Now, now the, the the lower than expected loss is due to new games and cost cutting, uh, a lot of cost cutting at Nintendo, and they expect to still make 35 billion yen operating profit for the full year. Now, last year at the same time, so if you want to compare, like, has Nintendo been doing better? Last year at the same time, they had a 37.7 billion yen loss. So this is an improvement to lose 10 billion. I know that sounds strange, but it's an improvement. We sales were about in half, 710,000 units sold compared to 1.5 million last year. DS sales were down, uh, which is probably a good thing because Nintendo still isn't profitable on the 3DS at all. Uh, because well, they said that they confirmed that they are now profitable. They coming weren't, close. They weren't to be in able this quarter. This quarter they were coming close. They're saying now, now we're there. All the Super. 3DSs we sell now, we actually make money on. And so you know, this morning I was looking at the story. I'm like, okay, now what can Nintendo do? I know I've asked this question lots of times, so I just asked people on Twitter this time. I'm like, guys, what do you think? What does Nintendo have to do to become the number two or number one video game company again? And one guy, Crash Kincaid, he's saying, make games for gamers. Do you think that Nintendo making a serious play for serious gamers, is something that they've kind of ignored for the past couple of well generations of consoles they've gone for the casual gamer they've gone for this not graphics intensive not super he heavy on the on the hardware is that the kind of thing that would help nintendo regain that uh, marketplace leader that they used to be i don't know i feel like there are nintendo's nintendo titles that are beloved by people and have been for a long time because they're unique they're not just graphics intensive hardcore gaming uh titles and systems i don't really think that's the problem i think it's that they need to make it easier for people to play their games on a variety of devices. That's I think where it, I think that they're they're cutting me off. I think if Nintendo followed that advice, they might very easily become a Me Too company and and fall firmly into third place. Let's not forget that the Wii was the top selling console mm -hmm. from the moment it came out for quite a long time. And what they did was say, we are an alternative to the Xbox and the PS3. And that worked for them. Uh, also, don't forget that one of the reasons that they cut their loss in this last quarter was game title sales. Mm -hmm. So the games are popular. They're doing well. I think the problem is that their handheld business has been undercredited with supporting Nintendo. They, they, the, uh, the, the uh, DS and all of the handhelds from before were a big part of their sales, and the smartphone market is just eating all handheld sales alive. So we're in the middle of the trough between the Nintendo Wii and the Wii U. It's not a surprise that the Wii isn't going to carry them anymore because it's nearing the end of its life, and it had a shorter life expectancy than the PS3 and the Xbox, but they don't have that handheld game console to carry them through, which is what they planned. The 3DS and the DS were supposed to fill the gap until the Wii U comes, and it's not. Like, unlike a lot of companies, Nintendo usually makes a lot of profit on the hardware. The, the, I mean, a lot of Microsoft and, and Sony, when they came out with their last generation uh, consoles, they take a loss at the first generation of that console because it's meant to make up the money in, in software sales. And over the term of the seven or eight year life cycle, the parts get cheaper and they start making profit on the hardware. Now, Nintendo, I'm thinking it's, it's easier for an Xbox to go, okay, we can do high graphics games and then these casual games. I'm thinking Nintendo really needs to get into the cloud space like Sony did. So they go, look, here's our piece of hardware. It's It might not be the greatest piece of hardware. We'll still make a profit on it. But when you have our service, our service will take care of all the processing because you don't need, at this point, a super heavy-duty machine at your house. You just need a pretty good connection. I think that's what Nintendo needs to make a slight move into as well as including uh, other, other devices for handhelds. Maybe Nintendo should have bought Gaikai.
Let's get on uh, Let's uh, talk about Netflix earnings call because that was pretty good news as well. Yeah, so we talked to a few numbers earlier in the show, but um, their streaming subscribers worldwide are up. Not a lot, but from 26 million in the first quarter, they're up to about 27.5. Um, that's worldwide. The U.S. still makes up a huge majority of that. U.S. is, uh, of those numbers, almost 24 million customers are in the U.S. Of course, Netflix isn't available. <laughs> A lot of other places, so that's to be expected. Um, although DVD customers did drop uh, by about 850,000, so under a million, but still a big chunk, down to 9.24 million subscribers. So they're profitable. Um, they raked in almost 900 million in revenue, 6 million in net income. Um, they're launching an additional attractive European market in the fourth quarter. Uh, they expect that to result in temporary losses. But again, you think about Netflix around this time last year, this is a pretty hefty quarter. Things are looking up. Um, they've also made some internal changes. Um, they've got a new chief marketing officer, Kelly Bennett, form formerly a marketing executive over at Warner Brothers. Um, and then they've, they've, they've got some momentum. Uh, the Epic Steel, uh, which gives Paramount, MGM, and Lionsgate uh, movies to uh, streaming subscribers, although it's 90 days after they debut on on the, on the pay-per-views and the subscription VOD services. But what's really interesting, um, besides all of that, is the idea that maybe Netflix and HBO could have been working together. Now, what together. gives us that idea, Reed, Reed Hastings, Hastings. Yeah, yeah, CEO Reed Hastings hinted, hinted at an HBO deal in a letter to shareholders, uh, which was quickly squelched by Netflix themselves. Uh, spokesman over at HBO, Jeff Cusson, uh, 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 it gave a statement that said, we're not in discussions and have no plans to work with Netflix, which is one of those things where you're like, Tom's my best friend. And Tom's like, I've never even met you. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> don't even know who you are, which what? is kind of embarrassing. He, Hastings clarified, yeah, there isn't an agreement. And then said, we're just another network. And then when you have multiple networks, they often find ways of working together, which is really a very roundabout way of saying, I was just... Wishful thinking. I was just stirring the pot. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. It's not just wishful thinking when you put it into a letter to investors. You're you're trying to sure. You're trying to get you're people planting excited. an idea in exactly. someone's head. And this is not to say that they haven't had any discussions. There probably have been some pretty hardcore discussions between Netflix and and HBO. Like we're gonna break yeah. you. We're gonna crush With you. Armor Those and kind of swords. Well, I mean, Reed Hastings has. He's been. We, we saw that report about Netflix and how it did all that switching with Quickster and how he's a bit hasty when it comes to saying things and doing things. So maybe they were in preliminary negotiations. Like, hey, yeah, we had a lunch. And HBO's like, that wasn't what you thought it was. Maybe yeah. you know, it's kind of like he's like the overly attached uh, CEO. We, were, very much we like, were just sitting at a shared table. We, we were even, just at the same conference we, we had in, separate checks, in Idaho. Okay. You know, yeah. We just happened to be in the same building. We're not in a negotiation with you when we said <laughs> right. hi. Uh, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't surprise me if, if, if um, Netflix was going after HBO. I mean, that's a crown jewel for cable. It's a crown jewel for, for whoever gets the streaming rights to that. That has a ton of original content. And if they did land something like that, it would make Netflix like a must-have kind of subscription service. I think this is all actually uh, a, a bunch of, I don't want to say crap, but I'll say it. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, Who cares? I, HBO and Netflix are not going to work together anytime soon. I don't know what Hastings is up to putting this in, into an investor note, uh, but he's got good news. He should focus on that. A year ago, people were wondering if Netflix would survive. There was mm -hmm. a subscriber revolt. There was all the quickster crap. This past quarter, they didn't do anything stupid. And they grew subscribers by 530,000. So Netflix is back and on solid footing. They may not getting, be getting the skyrocketing numbers that they did have for many years, but that couldn't have lasted forever anyway. So it's, it's good to see that Netflix is back on firm footing. And I, I think that should be what, what people are most happy about, if you like Netflix. There was also a comment in chat a couple of minutes ago when we were talking about this additional European market that they're planning to launch in Q4, saying, yeah, that might result in temporary losses for Netflix. But they might end up, be, it might be a very key time yeah. where if there's a recession and people are like, well, I got to pay less money for content. Maybe I don't have everything via Netflix that I would with a cable subscription, but I end up spending however many dollars less. It could be good for them. And apparently they're doing well in the UK and that's where they're getting great subscriber growth. And mm -hmm. so that's a bulwark against flattening subscriptions elsewhere is to open new markets. That's important.
All companies need to figure out how to make money. Foursquare is no exception. Do we like the way they're trying to make money off of us? It's a check-in service, right? right. Foursquare, I mean, it survived challenges from GoWalla and Facebook check-ins and all kinds of, actually, Facebook buying GoWalla. It's still around. And so what are they going to do? They want to make some money. I know it's a crazy idea. Uh, they announced promoted updates. And when you visit Foursquare, you'll see the ads at the top. Now, it's like an image, and it'll actually be clearly marked uh, in a yellow text that's not exactly gigantic. It says promoted, and uh, these ads are based on your check-in history and your friend's activity, and Foursquare wants these things to be unobtrusive and relevant to the, the, the customer. It's a pilot program starting today. They've got tw like 20 or so, like I said, in the news for uh, advertisers, The Gap, H&M, JCPenney. So if I, get the, if I get this right, if Sarah checks in and leaves a tip at a restaurant, and I happen to be near that, and mm -hmm. I'm following Sarah on Foursquare, and the company has paid for it, then that'll show up first. That's right. So okay. there's a lot of a lot of ifs when it comes to that. I mean, I'm I'm kind of curious. You know, is a promoted update? I mean, Twitter obviously uses that, that, that for tweets. Promoted tweet instead of mm -hmm. saying advertisement or sponsored. Is that kind of the way to go for advertising on these kinds of devices? I mean, for Twitter, I kind of use that. I don't mind the promoted things if they're relevant. I don't mind. Obviously, I don't mind targeted ads, like I've said hundreds of times on the show. I think the way the Foursquare method is going, it seems like it's actually useful. Yeah, this is something that, it, at first glance, it reminds me a lot of Yelp. Oh, when I search for a certain restaurant on Yelp, the first two or three results are promoted, and I just scroll past those. I don't pay any attention. Foursquare seems to be taking that a little bit further and saying, well, it is based on your check-in history and also what your friends are doing. So even though this is a promoted result, it's something that is more relevant to you than just McDonald's paid for this, so it goes at the top. Everybody was really excited and a little nervous about Twitter doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The exact same thing, where you can promote a tweet, but it'll only show up as promoted if someone you follow follows this, and it'll explain why it's doing it. And I haven't seen a lot of backlash against that. I've only seen one of these actually show up in my feed, and it was interesting to me, even though it, you know it, it's essentially like a forced retweet. Uh, and and instead of LeVar Burton retweeting this, they, the company that he was talking about promoted that particular post and it showed up as a promoted tweet. So I, I see this as the same thing and I think it's a very elegant way to do it. I think it's more, it's even more niche than it comes to Twitter. I mean, Twitter, yeah. you could be reading it for lots of different reasons and you're like, I don't want to read this ad about food when I was trying to look at the news. But when it comes to Foursquare, you're probably thinking about, I'm going to go somewhere or I'm outside already. Give me a different idea of what's out there because I remember going, oh, there's an explore tab. I'm going to see what else is around because I didn't even notice that. I was just using it for check-in. So I think it's because of what the app actually does, it's a great idea to show, hey, by the way, near you is something your friends like. So go check it out. Foursquare is all about discovery these days. I mean, it's about check-ins and mayorships and there's a lot of that legacy fun of Foursquare that isn't going away. But they know that in order to become a useful service that doesn't require you to maybe like have a bunch of other friends that are even using the app. This is the way that they have to go. And as long as it helps with discovery, I think that they do have to make money. And this is a, it seems to be an elegant way to, to try to get into that. Yeah, I, I, and I think what you're describing, I as is, is just the difference between Twitter and Foursquare. Mm -hmm. I have that reaction, whether it's promoted or not. I don't want to see something about food, <laughs> but it's there, it's Twitter. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. So Samuel Jackson and his neighbors want $750,000 paid to them by AT&T. Why? Because AT&T put a cell tower on top of their apartment building in New York and then forgot to meter it and the building got charged instead. And they were supposed AT&T was supposed to install its own electric supply line and meter and they just didn't. So kind of this idea of piggybacking on somebody else's, it's like plugging an extension cord in somebody else's apartment. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get this for free for a while. That's, I mean, at and doesn't really need a lot of bad publicity, but I'm just thinking if I just could imagine Samuel Jackson yelling about this. That's I, The second I saw this article, I'm like, yep, he's the, he's the face of the class action. I want to see him I'd yelling. probably watch a major motion picture about it. If he's the star. Yeah, get these about the condo, off my roof. the homeowners association going after their $750,000. I'm tired of these AT&T antennas on my Get these roof. mother <laughs> antennas off the roof. Now, let's check the calendar. 
Tomorrow, the 26th, earnings week continues. Facebook and Amazon are both uh, reporting their earnings. Uh, will Windows 8 consumer features be unveiled at Nokia World on September 5th? Windows Phone 8. Probably. Why am I asking this question? Well, because that's what Chinese website WP Dang is reporting. Also, uh, they say that Nokia will be unveiling two Windows Phone 8 devices during the event. No word on the, if the devices will come with pure view technology or not as mm, of yet. I love those megapixels. World of Wordcraft. World of Warcraft. Of oh, Wordcraft. Wordcraft is like Scrabble. <laughs> right between consonants and... It's a plug they in. don't apply. Mists of Pandaria <laughs> is launching on September 25th, 2012. Pre-sales are now open. So Bought it. I bet you did. <laughs> And I bet you got the digital deluxe edition. I did. I paid, the, I paid the 60 bucks. $40 for your standard edition, but for $60, you get in-game items from the retail collector's edition, World of Warcraft Pet and Mount, a banner sigil. Is that how you say sigil. it? Sigil. <laughs> and uh, accent for Diablo 3, Battle.net portraits for StarCraft 2. It's goodies, so that's 60 bucks. Finally, Microsoft says that its Build 2012 event will kick off on October 30th. That's a week after the Windows 8 launch, and it will last through no November 2nd. Company's going to talk about Windows Azure, Windows Phone 8, Windows Server 2012, Visual Studio 2012, and the event will be held on its campus in Redmond, Washington. Registration for the event will open on August 8th at 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. rather Pacific time. I'll be out September 26th, just so you know. Where are you going to be? It's Yom Kippur, so obviously I'll be playing Mr. Pandaria. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from Matt, the Linux geek, who says, Hey, TNT crew, I wanted to make a quick comment on yesterday's show. My wife went to film school, and one of her friends in school moved on to the adult film industry as a producer and editor. So let's just caveat this right now. It's an email from someone we don't know saying a friend of his wife. But she later married, the friend, later married one of the larger directors in the adult film industry. If I stated any of their movies, I'm certain you would know them as they gained mention in even some of the mainstream media. This is interesting because just this year she came to town and was talking about the market and these lawsuits. She stated that they've pushed out purchasing new cameras and general gear in lieu of gaining more legal counsel. She went on to describe that they hired a group to perform a study where they hoped to learn at what size file people were most likely to download. They created very short films with extremely explicit names in the hopes of getting people to download them and then bullying them into paying money and stated last year the money they made in these type of suits equaled 20% of their revenue. Now, again, we only have Matt's word to go on this, but it's an anecdotal uh, piece of story saying that what this guy we were talking about yesterday in his countersuit claims is happening, which is companies making a business model off of threatening lawsuits, may actually be happening. Go to the email from Michael uh, with a subject line, why not micro USB? Of course, talking about uh, the story yesterday, 19 pin connectors from Apple. He says, video out, video out. Video out. Yeah. Look how problematic MHL is. On my iPhone and iPad, I have a very simple and awesome BGA adapter, which works for any projector. It's one of the simplest things I've done for presenting in a long time. Got a lot of emails all. saying video out is a one nonsense. of the big advantages. That's of a nonsense thing. I gotta say, Why airplay. is that nonsense? There's airplay on this device. There's no need for this. Like, oh, we don't need to switch so to micro no USB. So no one will ever uh, no, I didn't want say ever. to connect a, a, a wire from their iPad to their television because everyone will have an Apple TV? I'm just saying that Apple could have moved to micro USB and promoted the fact that they have AirPlay devices or allowed more receivers to work with AirPlay. I don't think that I don't think that's a good argument. I, I, I think a better argument is the elegance that providing the video through the proprietary connector provides. I mean, uh, Jason, how is the experience of HDMI being separated from the micro USB working? Well, I can speak from my own experience. My Galaxy Nexus is MHL compatible, and I have an MHL you know, adapter that requires you to plug it into the USB port as well as be powered through a regular USB port somewhere else. Like, it's not elegant by any stretch of the imagination. And actually, the MHL adapter, mind you, you could blame the adapter itself, but it no longer works. So it's kind of a cheap thing. So I don't know, maybe if Apple went that way and made their own kind of version of those adapters, maybe it would be a little bit more elegant, but not nearly, I, in my mind, as elegant as what you get right now. Sure, it's a proprietary adapter, but it works. When you I know what you're in. saying, Iaz, which is it wouldn't be uh, unusual for Apple to say, like, this is the way you want to do it now. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a little too far to say. You'd have to go buy an Apple TV if you ever want to put the video out. Well, there's a, uh, video out you want to be an enterprise, the right? The thing is that AirPlay does work audio-wise on a lot of receivers. And if they just enabled other manufacturers to have that capability to do the mirroring. But Apple wants to go enterprise. 
they're going to go into the enterprise and say you want you want to project your uh, your presentation from your iPad. You have to use an Apple TV. Well, I mean, print airplane everything, so why not? There's a, a There's video, like audio, airplay capabilities in my new receiver. Okay. So, so they can do it. It's yeah. not quite it's, there. It's happening. I don't, I don't think so. I disagree. I don't know. Right, 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 right. Cables for all. There we go. Everybody happy? Yes, I'm just making things up. I do hate Tom. cables. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just a curmudgeon today and every day. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening and submitting stories on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. That's a place to let us know what you'd like us to cover each and every day. We look at that when we look around the web at what stories we want to cover. Uh, you can uh, find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv. You can even give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Stephen Shanklin from CNET joins us tomorrow. I'll see you then. Cables for all, cables for none. No, no, don't do it. Ah.